Again, first and foremost, thank you everybody. You know, um, my husband's gonna go and hand out note cards and what I said is, as I finished my dissertation, I wanted to crowdsource in the immediate moment. And so something you like, something you would push back on and something that was new to you, you know, and just leave them on the side and everything. All right, so I'm gonna start with an article I wrote uh, 20 years ago and then kind of go through the presentation. I'm willing to share this as well. And, um, and I also have business cards up here. I still have business cards. Yesterday, an interesting thing happened to me. I was told I was not black. The kicker for me was when my friend stated that the island of Puerto Rico was not part of the African diaspora. I wanted to go back to the old school Bronx playground days and yell, you said, what about my mama? But after speaking to several friends, I found out that many black Americans and Latinos agree with him. The miseducation of the Negro is still in effect. I'm so tired of having to prove to others that I am black, that my people are from the motherland, that Puerto Rico along with Cuba, Panama, the Dominican Republic, Mexico, are part of the African diaspora. Do we forget that slave ships drop off our people all over the world, hence diaspora? The Atlantic slave trade brought Africans to Puerto Rico in the early 1500s. Some of the first slave rebellions took place in Puerto Rico. Until 1846, Africanos on the island had to carry libreta to move around, much like the passbook system in apartheid South Africa. In Puerto Rico, you will find large communities of descendants of the Yoruba, Bambara, Wolof, and Mandingo people. Puerto Rican culture is inherently African. There are hundreds of books that will inform you, but I do not need to read book after book to legitimize this thesis. All I need is to go to Puerto Rico and look around me. All I really need is to look in the mirror every day. All I really need is to see my father every day. I'm often asked what I am, usually by black African Americans who are lighter than me and by Latinos who are darker than me. To answer this question, I say, I'm a black Boricua, Black Rican, Puerto Rican. Almost always a question about why I choose to call myself black over Latina, Spanish, and Hispanic. I am not Spanish. Sa Spanish is just another colonizer's language that I was forced to speak. I'm not Hispanic. My ancestors are not descendants of Spain, and I will never claim colonization and rapists. I define my existence by race and land. Borinquen is the indigenous name of the island of Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico literally was called Court of Riches. And if you see statues in this country, there's actually one in Albany where you'll see Puerto, P-O-R-T-O, -O, you know? Being Latino is not a cultural identity, but a, rather a political one that was enforced on us. Being Puerto Rican is not a racial identity. Why do I have to consistently explain this to those who are so-called conscious. My blackness is one of the greatest powers I have. We live in a society that devalues blackness all the time, and I will not be devalued as a human being, as a child of the Supreme Creator. Although many of us in activist circles are enlightened, many of us have baggage that we have to deal with. Many times I'm asked why many Boricuas or Dominicans refuse to affirm their blackness. I attribute this denial to the ever rampant anti-black sentiment in America and throughout the world. Often Puerto Ricans who assert our blackness are usually outcast by Latinos who identify more with their Spanish conqueror than the African ancestors, but were also shunned by black Americans who sometimes do not see us as black. Nilly Fuller, a great black sociologist stated, until one understands the system of white supremacy, Anything and everything else will confuse you. Divide and conquer still applies. To me, being black is not just phenotype or skin color. This is not a discussion on colorism. To assert who I am is the most liberating and revolutionary thing I can ever do. Being a black Puerto Rican encompasses me racially, ethnically, and importantly, gives me a homeland to always refer to. So as the goat of hip hop, Rakim said, I am whatever I say I am. Now, if you don't know who Stephen Biko is, then you don't 
understand the apartheid movement in South Africa. Stephen Biko was comrades with Nelson Mandela. The NAC went a double way, and see Biko and more revolutionary forces in um, apartheid South Africa really laid down the great, the, 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 all the work, you know? And he says, being black is not a matter of pigmentation. Being black is a reflection of a mental attitude. My story begins in the South Bronx in 1972. I did not grow up in a movement household. I did not grow up understanding politics or studying history. I did have a great sense of pride as a Puerto Rican. My family, I, I grew up bilingual, mostly Spanish speaking until we moved somewhere else. We always were with our abuela and abuelos and um, my parents always took us to Puerto Rico two to three times a year. I knew nothing about the history of my people, what happened to our nation. I did not know why we were made US citizens. I did not know we were a colony. I did not understand freedom fighters for decades that were hunted, attacked, assassinated, or incarcerated for fighting for Puerto Rico to be free. I did not know that birth control methods such as the IUD and the pill were tested on Puerto Rican women first. I did not know that one third of the women in Puerto Rico were sterilized between the 1930s and the 1970s. The practice was so common, it was called la operación, the operation. The same doctor that started this practice would then be moved to Lincoln Hospital in the Bronx, where I grew up, where he would go on to sterilize more Puerto Rican women and over 20, uh, 2,200 African American women without their knowledge. I had to go to college to find out who I was. I had to take black studies, Puerto Rican studies, feminist studies, to understand why I had not learned anything political or historical, not only about my people, but African American, Native American, Asian Pacific Islanders, and so many other people of color throughout the world. In my sophomore year, I mistakenly got put into a class for juniors with Dr. Vivian Verdell Gordon. She was my mentor until she passed. She's literally the reason I'm even here and all the work that I've done. Um, Dr. Gordon was the first black woman to receive her PhD from the University of Virginia. And if you know anything about the University of Virginia, that is crazy. You know, like, she also started the Upward Bound program and she created the National Council of Black Studies. She took me under her wing. So my sophomore year, as I was in her class, I then went to two our main organizations at SUNY Albany at that time, was Fuerza Latina and the Albany State University Black Alliance, ASUBA. So I went to Fuerza Latina, but I was very quickly turned off because the people presenting only spoke in Spanish. And I'm like, yo, you can't assume that every, at that time we were still using Hispanic. You know, you can't just assume like, Spanish is not an arbiter of how we are as a people. You know, like, being bilingual was a problem in New York City public schools. They did not allow you to be bilingual. And my personal experience is when my mom and dad moved us to Westchester County, because it's 1978, y'all. The Bronx is burning. Heroin is ravishing. Puerto Rican communities. Crack's about to, you know, be, come another, uh, well, we all know why crack was released in our communities. But, you know, and I, I, I specifically also remember one of, the, if not the second biggest blackout in America was the, um, the blackout in 1977. You know, so, you know, I, when my parents moved us, I now understand why my mom did not want me to speak Spanish anymore. And in fact, in middle school, you know, we were the first Latinos in this little town in Westchester County, New York, between White Plains and Greenberg, a little village called Elmsford, New York, right? So every day they would pull me out of a class and put me in a room with a teacher who would yell at me and yell at me and yell at me until I said it right in English. And then because the town at that time was half African American, white American, we were the first Latinos. You know, so we got what especially our um, other brothers and sisters got, but I would, kids would run and be like, mira, mira, they would make fun of my food and all of that, you know? Um, 
And I really didn't start to process that even till very recently when I told my mom what they did when they took me in. So I, I'm like, yo, y'all can't just speak Spanish. So then I go to the Asuba meeting and I, you know, I remember I'm sitting there and I'm telling you, in the 90s, our meetings were like 400 people. Okay, when the BSU had a meeting, or Fuerza Latina had a meeting, or the Third World Within Collective had a meeting, we are talking three to 400 people. Very different time. We didn't have social media. We didn't even have printers. There was no email. You didn't even have your own phone. You had to share a phone with your suite mate. You know, so the technology, thank God, you know, we didn't have it, honestly, because that has really destroyed so much of grassroots organizing. So I go, and I'm like intrigued. So I go to the brother who's the president, and I said, man, I want to be in this organization, but I'm not a person of African descent. And he's like, you are, read a book, come to the meeting next week. <laughs> and I did. And then with Dr. Gordon, I would then um, be in Africana studies. To this day, all my academic work is in black studies. I'm, I love it. Latin American studies don't want me. Chicano studies don't want me. Like, I'm like, I'm good. I'll say where I've been. Black studies, Pan-African studies for over 25 years, you know? So um, it is black student and black programs that recruited me to be like, no, you need to talk about this. So you need to talk about the young lords of political prisoners and all of that. So anyway, I'm taking classes. I'm like, drop my major political science. I'm like in every black Puerto Rican studies class, everything. And I went home for Thanksgiving and my parents were like, what you've been learning? I'm like, everything y'all didn't tell us and what the F and how didn't I know this? You know, my dad's like, listen, Kosi, my dad tells a story about when he came, you know, to, to, to New York, he was a, a cab driver in Brooklyn and he got pulled over and it got intense with the police and the police called him the N word. And I said, what, like, what happened? He goes, I said to him, I'm not the N-word, I'm Puerto Rican. And the cop was like, yeah, you still the N-word. You know, so, and also like, my dad himself, especially the, the um, Puerto Rico, you didn't even use racial or ethnic terms. You were Puerto Rican and that's it. That's all. There was, you know, none of this existed. The language did not exist. So I'm taking these classes, I'm taking black psychology, you know, realizing not only did I have to cleanse my mind, my body, and my spirit, I began to understand through my psychology class, trauma inflicted on me, on our people. I changed my mentor. I then would meet, look, I took classes with only black women. Every single one of my professors was a black woman in the 90s. You go to many campuses now, black women, first hired, first fired, and the undue burden of being a black woman, which they basically think you're also everybody's mom, you know? And I'm like, I start talking to my parents, I'm like angry, I don't understand. And then I went to an event, and Richie Perez, may he rest in power always, in Panama Vicente Alba, and they were doing on um, um, Puerto Rico, uh, the co colonial situation. And I went after them and I said, what do I need to do? And they're like, you know, finish school when you're ready, come be an organizer in, in, in New York. The most defining moment of my time, people ask me, when did you know that you were in the work? April 29th, 1992, the rebellion that happened for 10 days in LA because the officers that beat Rodney King were tried, not convicted, and let go. And what younger folks need to understand, for my generation, that was the first time that you see on a video someone being beat, okay? We're sitting in the classes, we're watching Eyes on the Prize, we're watching Chicano Studies, American Indian Movement, Fred Hampton, the we're watching but this was the first time for our generation that we were like, that's what they do, and we've been telling it, you know? So I get on the campus, and it's from one of my dear friends. I think he might have walked in, but doc, uh, he's Dr. Paul Buckley. You know, we're, he asked me, he said, do you remember white people at SUNY? And I was like, no, I don't. 
Now, mind you, there were 10,000 white people and like 2,000 of us. And what that made me realize was like, you know what? A critical mistake has been made where our people, especially in academia and nonprofit, want to always make white people look better, always want to center white people. What are their feelings? What? I don't care. I don't care about your feelings. And we didn't, and what it was was we were just like, we're running this, and we did. We took over student government with a $3 million budget. We brought out Craig Mack and Biggie Smalls, and Craig Mack was the headliner. You know, like, we had KRS-One, we had Carnival. Like, it was an exciting, exhilarating time. You're also, as a student, coming out of um, the late 80s, and particularly the student struggle in the United States to end apartheid, right? So it's exhilarating. It's the golden age of hip hop. You know, you organize, you're debating, you're getting pushed back. Like, it was incredible. And someone was like, you should run. And I was like, all right. I ran. I became the president of Asuba, the first woman in 15 years, and then the first Boricua. But a couple days after that, the Latino paper called me a sellout. And I had some pushback from particularly African-American folks, like, you're not black, you shouldn't be president. And I was like, I won, I am, you're confused, I'm gonna keep it moving. <laughs> so, and the reason I could do that was because of people like Dr. Gordon and Professor Sutherland and, and, and Professor Lois Owens and Dr. Slade and Black Studies, Dr. Clark, the Education Opportunities Program, one of the greatest programs to ever bring young people into higher ed from working class communities, right? So it was very, very exhilarating. But a couple of days after, oh, she's she, why, she can't be president, she ain't black, all that. The director of multicultural affairs, a Latino brother, called me in and said, you need to pick. You with us or you with them? I'm like, dude, you're the director of multicultural affairs. What are you talking about? Who is them? Right? Who's them? I told his boss, and I was like, he's whack. I don't ever want to see him again. And I, I feel like I was fearless, but I'm, I'm definitely, I, I, I was nervous. People don't know that I was actually a very quiet person until, like, when I became 16 and 17, was being exposed to stuff. Like, I spent a lot of years in silence and turmoil, and, um, but I was a vociferous reader. I read everything and anything all the time. My parents would be like, eat the cereal, don't read the box. I'm like, I want to read, you know? What's in the box? But um, <laughs> I became fearless for sure because what I was learning fed my soul. I learned about the invasion of our respective homelands like Puerto Rico, Panama, Jamaica, Somalia, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Colombia, Hawaii. It was in college that I read Harriet Tubman's Sojourner Truth, that I read Fidel Castro, Lolita Lebron, the Weather Underground, American Indian Movement, Black Panther Party, Black Liberation Army, Los Machateros, and then hip hop. The more I learned, the angrier I got. And I stayed in a very angry space. And then I remember Dr. Sutherland saying, that's the first, now you gotta transition you're angry, what are you gonna do? And what's your commitment to the people? And always be aware of your mental health. Through this personal transformation, I became a critical thinker, a debater, a challenger to the white supremacist domination of our people. I became the president of Asuba and I never looked back. Those five years at SUNY Albany and subsequently being recruited by one of the greatest academics and revolutionaries ever, Dr. James Turner, who um, passed away this last August, but Dr. Turner was friends with Malcolm X, and he would tell us, and you know, do the right thing had come out, and all, you know, and he would be like, Malcolm became dangerous when he was talking about people around the world, right? And you look at even Dr. King, right? Because Fannie Lou Hamer and you know, I, well, Fannie Lou Hamer was like, I'm not even going up in all of this. Like, we're black, we need to get free. You know, but Fannie Lou and so many other women's stories are completely obscured in many spaces of the civil rights movement, right? So, you know, learning this and then Dr. Turner saying, do you want to code at Cornell? Come get your master's in Africana studies, but I want you to study Puerto Rico 
Puerto Ricans in the counterintelligence program. And the counterintelligence program was started by J. Edgar Hoover in 1955 during the Red Scare. Then he spent 80% of his time um, destabilizing Dr. King, right? They, they, they put audio in his room. They knew he was having affairs. They would call Coretta and be like, your husband's sleeping, he's gonna leave you. Or they would write letters. And this created what we call disruption and discord. Because then you're starting to be like, yo, who's my enemy? Who's, who's an undercover cop and all of that, right? But the counterintelligence program said that the biggest internal security threat to the United States of America was the Black Panther Party. And the second, the Puerto Rican independista movement. And now you look at how five years ago the FBI was caught again spying on Black Lives Matter and saying that the Black Lives Matter movement was an internal threat. Not all the white crazy young men out here killing us, killing everything in his sight. They're not a threat. But the counterintelligence program assassinated leaders. It assassinated Fred Hampton, Mark Clark, Bobby Hutton. It incarcerated political prisoners, some still in jail for 52 years. The last five years has been an incredible moment around our political prisoners and prisoners of war. And if you're gonna do the work of organizing and you don't understand that this country has political prisoners like Leonard Peltier, the move, uh, oh no, sorry, a move has come out. When Oscar Lopez Rivera came out, Sundiato Coley came out, Herman Bell came out, Jalil Munta King came out, Matumu Shakur. That actually speaks to a 25 year movement to free our political prisoners, right? So Dr. Turner is like, you need to understand and you need to really use your scholarship to not just talk about what has happened to us, but our resistance. This government was so afraid of the Black Panther Party that started free breakfast programs that it had a policy of catch and kill. That's what, and then the Weather Underground, people may know the students for Democratic Society, the Weather Underground were all white radicals who literally were bombing, because that's what took in the 70s and 80s, things were being bombed in this country. The Weather Underground's the reason we even knew that COINTELPRO was really in effect. But the Weather Underground was all white radicals and they pledged their lives to black liberation. So understand, part of that, and I, you know, it's important because White young people don't know their own history of the people who gave up their lives who are white radicals. All young white people know is that they somehow had something to do with slavery, Dr. King, we're free, and it messes with white minds, right? Like, you know, I, I was watching Wanda Sykes in her in comedy special, and she said, then this, this attack on critical race theory, woke, banning books, they're not afraid of us. These white people are seeing their own kids turning on them. And during Black Lives Matter and George Floyd, right, we started seeing where she's like, Dad, you're mad racist. And he's like, where do you learn that? And she's like, on TikTok, do you know what's going to happen? And Dad, why, you know, don't do this, don't do that. I'm oh, sorry, I just want to keep track of time. Oh, all right. And in focusing on that, not only did that bring me into a circle of incredible people like Fred Hampton Jr., um, it led me to join my political home to this day, the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement. So I put these kind of data points right here, so I don't, you know, if you wanna copy, I mean, you could just look it up, I'll send it to you. But this is dem demographic data from 2016. A quarter of U.S. Hispanics identifies Afro-Latino. If there's 60 million of us, that means 15 of us know who we are and we get nothing. Latino organizations don't want us. Latino studies don't want us. They want to use terms to divide us from other people. They want to sow confusion. You know, like, when's the last time you saw an Afro-Latino on TV besides Sonny Halston, who is literally the only Afro-Latino at that level of media, and then Omar Jimenez and Natasha Alford, who do reporting for CNN, right? And part of us being also in the academy, right? And this is what, the people say code switch. I'm like, nah, this is what our people do. There's the data, 
right? We can put it in these words, but if you go out in the streets right now, the hood, the bodegas, everybody, and you're like, yo, you Latinx? They'll be like, no, dude, I'm Mexican. Who is that? You know? And part of that is a disconnect because most of our people will never be in higher education, right? That's just what it is. And now academia is suffering. Students are like, why? What's the point? AI, chat, G? Like, the, but it's the devaluation of education. It's devaluing that people need to read books and not just Wikipedia. You got to understand people like Franz Fanon. Five? Yeah. Lolita. I mean, it's, it's so much. So, and then this one particularly, and this has to be the starting point for those doing this work. The narrative in the United States of America is that most Africans who were captured ended up in the United States. Absolutely not. Most of the Africans that were captured and enslaved through the transatlantic slave trade ended up what we now call Latin America. So right here, you, I mean, it's small, but the United States, 307,000 um, people that they would enslave. Cuba, 765,000. Jamaica, obviously, 935,000. The Caribbean alone, almost 3 million. Haiti, which is why they hate Haiti, the first black republic ever. And to this day, France and the United Nations puts their disgusting imperialist root. Yo, people don't understand Haiti. Then Dominicans will be like, uh, you know, maybe there's been issues with Haiti. You know, and it's like, y'all on the same island, you know? But, but what happened in the Dominican Republic that, you know, it's easy for people to be like, yo, why Dominicans man anti-black? I'm like, they live in America. Why would they want to be black if they didn't have to say they were black? Like, this is, you know, they didn't only colonize our lands. They colonized our minds. So, yeah, if you're from the DR and you come to the United States and people are like, you're just Dominican, not black, but eventually you black. If you're in New York City, you're going to find out real quick who you are, you know? <laughs> in any of these places, but why hide this information? Why? And you can't hide it. That's the whole point, right? You can't hide it. And then I have some terms here, anti-black. I think it's an important term, but I'm kind of tired of it. I'm like, when did Latinos all of a sudden become the most anti-black people in the country? Let's, you see what I'm saying? That narrative that younger Latinos are pushing on Instagram, it's like, read a book before you say that dumb shit. Like, don't say that, and then don't put it on us. Put the onus on white supremacy. We didn't start this, you know? But it's important you understand anti-black, always racial capitalism, the work by Cedric Robinson, of course, the black radical tradition by Robin Kelly. Um, white supremacy, we already know what white supremacy is. It's in the White House, so, you know, <laughs> that's what it is. But the, the most important academic or activist in that time, in, in the early 1900s, during the Harlem Renaissance, would be Arturo Schomburg, right? So we didn't know as Puerto Ricans who Schomburg was, because Schomburg is a German name, but Arturo Schomburg was born in Puerto Rico. He was kicked out for his independista, um, as they would call it, rants. He then comes to Harlem while the Harlem Renaissance is happening, and he writes a very short article, The Negro Digs Up His Past. And what he's saying in this article is, until you know who you are, they will keep enslaving you, and you won't know who you are. And because when New Orleans, and I use this, so this is 1965 here, somewhere in the city of New Orleans, no N, no Mexican, no Puerto Rican, and dogs allowed, right? That's 1965. Right? Um, and I put up the, when, when we beat America a while ago, the Puerto Rican national basketball team, but just visually, right? Those are all black brothers from Puerto Rico, you know? So, it's important to affirm who we are. I know, like one minute left. Because we live in a country that seeks to erase, particularly those of us who identify as African, Afro-Latino, Afro-Black, you know, we can go over all of that. And I do feel it's important to also say that when we're working with young people, right, especially with the Ferguson Rebellion, um, before that, Troy Davis, before that, the Genesis, 
you know, and, and what happened is the generation uh, after us, the hip hop generation, right? Millennials, Gen X, but you know, yeah, I lost my train of thought, sorry. But it's important that we understand that when our young people see 11 year old Tamir Rice killed or Ayanna Jones or George Floyd, Sandra Bland, Puerto Ricans suffering here while we didn't know what was happening after Hurricane Maria, seeing kids in cages, you know, all of that. We can't expect that our young people are gonna turn it off for 40 minutes and do, you know, be in a class. You know, we have to understand these are how students are coming to this. And luckily, we can't talk about trauma. We can't talk about the fact that most of us will never watch another video of a black, brown person being killed. For what? You know, we know it's dangerous. You know, you, people just hashtag, and it's a, it's a lot there, y'all. But ultimately, what we have to do now is tell the truth about the American project. It begins with kidnapping and enslavement of African people, forced chattel slavery, the purposeful killing, extermination, and breaking of indigenous people, including their land and their children. And I have to say, I don't lie when people do the land acknowledgement. We don't need you to acknowledge the land. You need to give it back to indigenous people. So you're whack. Let's acknowledge the people. I, I was like, absolutely not. You will not see me doing that. Give people what they deserve and what you took from them. Like a, an acknowledgement, it's a fake, it's not even making amends, it's just fake. And it's, you know what, happens in academic and nonprofit. What's branding right now? What's catchy? What's everybody doing? That's how Latinx comes into the dialogue, which I don't have a problem. Identify how you want. I don't use that term. I don't use Latinx, Latina, Latina. I don't really use Afro-Latina. I don't know if people are like introducing me, but I am a black Puerto Rican, right? So the land grab from Mexico in the Southwest, lynchings in the Southwest of Mexicans that never makes the books, and the denial of equality for women. Think about it. The founding fathers did not even want the women in their beds or their mothers to be equal. As a trained historian, I try to contextualize everything by looking at the past, understanding the present, and knowing that the future is shaped by not only events, but by people who struggle for justice. As we look at our history, we have to do two things, especially with young people. First is called racialization, purposeful racialization, right? I don't want my kids to know about um, you know, racism, they're too young. I'm like, the cops be killing six year olds, so they're not too young. And you know, like, no. So it has to be very purposeful, right? It, it, it's what it looks like in practice. Um, so when I have my daughter, you know, we're in the hospital, she's born January 1st. Fine, they take her and they bring her back, and then the social worker comes in and the certificate, her birth certificate, was already checked off as Hispanic. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna need one, that new one. Nah. <laughs> and I was like, who told you to check it? Oh, your last name. I said, what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> right? My husband was probably like, really? You just had like 18 hours of labor. Is this where it starts? I said, absolutely. <laughs> that is where it starts, right? <laughs> right? Misgendering and misnaming. That's exactly what it is, right? So not only do we have to look, we have to see what these personal resistance moments could look like. You know, but before the oppression and the colonization, we have a rich history that goes thousands of years. The American project is 450 years. That's not big in the span of time, right? So, we have to also, I don't talk a lot about voting, people could talk about, it, talk about it later, but look, our greatest leaders were never elected to office. And I would say 95% of all the Congress people ain't worth a damn thing, nada. 431 of you, and there's like, you know, 
obviously Rashida and AOC, but you can tell how the Dems have just shut them out of everything. Like, they're not gonna make it out of Congress, so they either need to leave and join the movement or run independently or something. Fannie Lou, Ida B, Harriet Sojourner, Nat, Lolita, Roberto, Albizu, Asada, Al Malcolm, our political prisoners never ran for office. So particularly for the young people and those who are having their own personal journey into how you identify, Toni Morrison um, came to UMass Amherst a while back and she said on the stage, never see yourself through the white gaze. Never filter yourself because you are scared. And we have to push back on traditions in our families and communities that are harmful and traumatic. We also have to be very aware that young people have disrupted everything we were taught around gender and sexuality. You know, because unfortunately, within certain spaces, you still can be transphobic, you know, it be attacked. So what we're seeing with all these attacks relates to basically, we know what's real in the information, the TVs and all this other madness are not even, they're just creating lies and stories and pushing the, these narratives. But look, unless we're ready to sacrifice, and everybody's sacrifice is different, but when you're doing this movement work and times are tough, you gotta have a crew around you of people. You gotta decide, I might need a couple of days off. You know, I'm a person, I, I, I'm, I have levity in my life. I can shut things down when I need to. But what I didn't do well, and I know all my other comrades are going through this is, you know, our elders always told us, don't burn out, don't do this. Don't. And then you turn 50 like, me and everything starts to fall apart, you know? And you wanna be like, no, but the movement feeds me. And I'm like, yes, but white supremacy is a vampire that sucks everything, <laughs> you know? So it's okay. Everybody plays a different role. You know, I'm not a rapper. Just like I don't think rappers are political figures. Like, I can't rap, don't come and tell me how I'm gonna vote, rapper number 27, like, nah. And it's usually all older men, so I'm like, you know, it, 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 and what it is is they're being challenged by younger people around gender and sexuality, and they're showing who they really are, that they're outdated, that young people are moving in a very, very different way. So I'm going to wrap up um, with a, a, a latest article. But three things that we can all do. First, when we win, we claim that victory. We celebrate it and we go back to resisting. I am a person that no longer, never really did, but I definitely don't do reform. I don't go to any reform prisons. You can't reform prisons, shut them down. I don't want to reform the system of capitalism, shut it down. I don't want to reform feminist spaces, shut it down. We also have to be aware that a lot of these visible leaders that they've been telling us are leaders are not our leaders and they don't care about us. They've shown in a lot of ways that they don't care about us. You can look at the older white feminist movement. I'm like, 50% of white women voted for Trump, so it's white women's fault, right? Like, no, it is. Every, I, like when it happened, I saw that statistic, I was like, so if I see four white women right now, two of them probably voted for Trump, and they're a professor, or they're trying to be progressive, or they're saying they get it, they're woke, they anti, you know, I'm like, no, no, half of y'all voted, and that's the reason we got Trump in the first place. So, you know, let's put the blame where it lies. And also the fact that they're destroying voting rights and access all over the country. So, one of my mentors as well, before he passed away, Kwame Ture said, the job of the conscious is to make the unconscious aware that they are not conscious. So I'm going to um, close out with this um, article and then we can open it up. And like I said, if you want to, um, the note cards and all of that, um, hopefully are going around. So I wrote this at the height of the Black Lives Matter movement because I had 
I had moved to LA for a, um, what is it? Yeah, so I had moved to, an, uh, to LA for a pre-doc fellowship at Cal State LA. We got there in September, I started teaching, and then immediately I joined Black Lives Matter LA. It was the first chapter, right? And actually I was living in the same community called St. Elmer Village with Patrice Colors. So I was like, oh, I'm gonna you know, meet Patrice. We got here, Dr. Abdullah brought me and the family out. So we go to the first meeting and there was um, a, a takeover that was happening two days after the meeting and they were like, can you come and cover it? I was like, absolutely. You know, y'all do what you're gonna do. We went through the rehearsal. Basically, we shut down the 101. Now, I was not supposed to get arrested, and I really tried not to get arrested, okay? Because I was there for two months, and I'm like, Jess, I gotta go, I'm helping now. We're about to do this crazy thing. You know, we're gonna stop traffic, but I'm gonna be taping on the, the side of the fence. So this picture right here is where we were detained. And I really did try to not get arrested, but what happened was the two highway patrol officers pulled out guns and was pointing at them at everybody who had shut down the freeway. I was on the other side on a fence. So I'm taping, I'm, do, I'm like, and I go, what the fuck? Yo, put your gun away, like what are you doing? And then white people who were stopped were like going crazy. It was, it was insane, but the people who did it did shut down the one-on-one -on -one in LA for four hours the day before Thanksgiving. The reason I got arrested was because I was like, I'm a citizen journalist. I just don't, like, I don't believe in, like, I'm here for the story. I'm like, nah, nah. I have to now engage as an organizer. We were arrested. My husband was like, please don't get arrested. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm not going to get arrested. <laughs> Melina's like, so Rosa got arrested. It's now the BLM 7. <laughs> um, and I had also, uh, right before I moved to LA, I had gone down to Ferguson. So Talib Kweli and Jessica care more, but Talib hit me and he's like, yo, I feel like Ferguson's different. I said, it is. I said, because Ferguson is a small community, right? But those brothers, those sisters, they got out there from day one. And what it was, was that was the working class community. So Rebel Diaz really watched Rebel Diaz and all the work they did. Oh wait, Sense, you were taping that? Right, I think since, yes, since is my homie from PR on the map. Um, yeah, I think since was there. Uh, so we get there and like, we go to the protest at eight o'clock and like three hours later, me, Kwali, and about 11 or 12 other people were um, bum rushed by the police. We got behind a concrete barrier and they were like, put your hands up or we will shoot you. You know, we little dropped and we're like this and you know, it's, before I left to go, my daughter said to me, mommy, you shouldn't go, like the police, what if they hurt you? And I'm like, no, we're gonna be with community, you know, um, thing. Was it scary? Yeah, you know, when you're doing this work, you always have to be prepared for anything. But also, um, Ferguson was just different, you know, and I was there when like Jesse Jackson and now Sharpton, we call them flyover activists and People just started coming out of everywhere, and y'all, you know, they're figuring out what fund they're gonna get, nonprofit, all of that. I'm like, yo, these are 15, 16, 17 year old people from the hood, and they told all of them, get out of our community. You are not running the show. So Ferguson also, after the Montgomery boy, bus boycott, was the longest protest in terms of days, right? So. All the work that I've done, you know, it's not like I do it by myself, you know, but I do, you know, there are moments where you have to be ready for anything, you know. So being that I was in BLM LA, you know, it, it, the entire narrative of like Latinos are not in BLM is bullshit, you know what I'm saying? No. Now, I'm in Cali, I know the different makeup. I know the community history of African American and Mexicans. I understand why the gang units and SWAT units were, were started in the 80s and also are about disruption and discord with these two communities. But what's interesting was when I was out there, I began to get younger 
um, as they call themselves blacks again, right, in my class. And one of the brothers who started using that term, I said, Lord, yeah. And I thought about it, I said, of course. It's African-American Chicano people. They've been living next to each other, working with each other, like all of that. So of course we're gonna see a generation of African men or women um, and, and um, Mexicano men or women like coming together relationships and you know, they're creating and the, the child is a black Mexican and that's real. And in fact, that year was the first time that the Mexico, the country of Mexico did a full census but that they also gave people the opportunity to check off Negro and 1.3 million Mexicanos did, right? And that's important because what it shows is that we, who still are not on the census form and have to create our own box, like she's not Hispanic, my daughter, she's other, black Puerto Rican, the census is what also keeps us divided because it wants us as Latinos to deracialize ourselves, right? So it's important to understand why power does what it does and why no one can ever, once you know who you are, and you know what politic, it doesn't mean that you don't grow your politic, but there's certain things you will not do anymore. Like I said, I don't do anything around reform. It all needs to go. And that's what Ferguson folks taught us. The whole damn system, burn it down. The whole damn system is guilty as hell, right? So I'm gonna end with this and then to the mic or whoever wants to dialogue. In 1993, I was a student at the State University of New York. Let me just pull up Martha. The queen um, came to speak on our campus. Until that evening, I had never heard the term Afro-Latina. I had just learned what it meant to be African descendant. Even though I had grown up in the Bronx and Westchester County and completely embraced and understood that I was Boricua, it was not until I went to college that I began to get to know who I truly was. The year before, I had joined the Albany State University Black Alliance, and through my involvement with peers who were racially and politically conscious, I was exposed to the true history of mi gente. This awakening of my racial consciousness led me to become an Africana Studies major. And to this day, I have been a scholar activist in the field of black studies. For me, it became clear that I was an African descendant, so I began to devour anything and everything I could, not only to learn the truth of who I was, but to also confront the lies I had been told by my teachers, my family, and the television. Although I began to identify as an African descendant, it was not until I joined the Malcolm X grassroots movement in 2000 that I began to identify as black. In too many movement spaces, conscious gatherings, and panels, I far too often was confronted and accused of selling out as a Latina. Without the mentorship of Dr. Maita Moreno-Vega and the late Richie Perez, as well as my comrades in the Malcolm X grassroots movement, I could not have navigated conscious movement and personal spaces that sought to take away my blackness. I cannot tell you how many times in these past years I have been asked why are you here, you're not black, why are you here, you don't belong in Black Lives Matter? Why are you here, you're a non-black person of color? When that many movement folks fail to realize is that in America, the binary of, excuse me, sorry, I gotta turn that off. The binary of black and white has always excluded Latinx people. One need only to look at the media to see that even in 2018, blackness in America means African American only. Never are we as black Latinx people represented in the media, but you will also rarely find black Palestinians, Africans, black Caribbean people in dialogues and discussions about race. Despite the growing numbers and growing consciousness around Afro black Latinx identity, much of the discourse makes the assumption that we have to subscribe to the dominant racial paradigm of African American and white American discourse, or that we have to choose between our black identity or our ethnic one. Going back to the late 19th century and early 20th centuries, Pan-Africanism signaled for the first time an explicit, organized identification with Africa and African descendants and more expansively of non-white people. 
With the United States occupation of Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the ever-growing migratory presence of both populations in New York and other northeastern cities like Chicago, the central concern of Afro-Latinx people at that was their relationship with African Americans and more globally with an African diasporic world. This pan-Africanist ideology was embodied mostly, most prominently by Arturo Afonso Schomburg, a black Puerto Rican who took part in anti-Spanish liberation struggles. A collector and bibliophile of worldwide Africana experiences, he helped to create the field of black history. Schomburg lived his life on the color line. His direct knowledge and experience of racism both in Latin America and the United States, and his alliances with other prominent African American historians of that time was groundbreaking, and at the end of his life, Schomburg identified as a black man. It's incumbent that we as black Latinx people in the United States heed the work of Franz Fanon, who wrote extensively about decolonizing the mind. It is also necessary that movement organizers organizers that fight for social justice affirm and acknowledge a new generation of unapologetic Afro-Latinx, black Latinx young people who are taking their rightful place in the black radical tradition. As one of my favorite groups, the Welfare Poets said on the 2000 album Project Blues, who we be, who I be, who we be. We be I, singular I. Now the essence of los Africanos and that of lo indio run within me. So when you call me Spanish, all my purity seems to vanish because that is not who I be. So don't refer to me with words that blur the trueness of my identity, defining me by a colonizer's language, disregarding my family lineage and my ancestral heritage. I be the rhythm of the conga played to an eternal bomba extending from Nigeria from a culture called Yoruba. No one will ever stop my blackness. It is who I be. Thank you, everybody. Palante siempre, palante. a couple minutes you know we still have time but we'll say even longer again I just want to thank everybody this is I feel like the first time where us when we doing this work this is like the year we all came together but I want to acknowledge something because I, I want to do so much work with the sisters so Dr. Terry Jett um, last year brought me to Indianapolis Indiana where I spent three days with the community we screened um, the screen the Fred Hampton or uh, well, the Judas and the Black Messiah. I was an associate producer on that. And you know, I was telling her that I was dealing with like some illnesses and then things really kind of fell apart for me and I'm dealing with craziness because you know, we're never believed as black women about our pain and you know, and I was talking to some of my friends last night and I said, what is it that still with doctors, we're always like, you're right, you're right, you know? and. So the surgery I had was major, and I was supposed to rest and recover, and I've been in pain since the end of November, and haven't rested or recovered. You know, because um, I had to advocate for myself every day, and every time I go home, I have to deal with another doctor, right? So what I, I don't ever want what happened to me to happen to particularly women, those who identify as women. Listen to your body. And when they tell you fibroids are not a big deal, you know why? Because we're the ones that get them. Because if white women were going through what I went through, and now that we also understand black maternal health in this country is horrible, you're gonna be by yourself. Like pain makes your world small. And I'm so grateful to have a community, you know? And so many incredible people, so many of them are here. And realizing like, damn, I can't walk right now the way I want to. The hardest part for me has been, I am a citizen's journalist. I wasn't trained in it, but I have become one. So when resistance is happening, I've been that person. My first journalistic endeavor was here in 2005. 
when I came with this brother, Brad Young, who is an incredible cinematographer. He, you know, he's worked with like The Arrival. He's the first and only to this day black cinematographer voted for an Oscar, but that was 2005. I had my daughter um, that year. Um, you know, so I'm seeing what's going down, and then I get a call, and it's like, you know, somebody told me, Brad, I said, all right, come, let's get in the car. And we went, um, him and then another brother, King Downey, and we drove from Brooklyn here. So we went through Alabama, right, and we started just talking to people. But then when we got here, the Ninth War was still on the water. Because the other brother that was with me was from the ACLU, the National Guard let us come in. And we went to that, I said yesterday to my husband, I can't even look at the Superdome. Because when I was reporting, there were dead bodies outside. But we, we, and then we went to uh, Malik Rahim, who was bringing people together, and then I just started doing stuff, and then I hit up my homie Davey, who I always tell people who really blew me up was Davey D when I wrote some of these early articles. He, to me, he is the premier hip-hop journalist, archivist of the culture. He's here, he's gonna be DJing tonight. You know, so it started for me here. But now I have to realize, maybe my role now is to more write and process and mentor young people. Maybe I won't be able to be on the ground like before, but that doesn't mean I don't play a part, you know? Um, so, yeah. Well, thank you. Let's open it up. Anybody got the mic? And I'm just gonna leave that this one up, the PowerPoint here. Um, if you want, if you have my email, I'll send it to you, but let me see. I just want. Okay, well I have a, a reading list of books. I can just give it to folks. And I'm gonna just hold here. All right. <laughs> yeah, just go to the mic so I can hear you and it's recorded. Sorry, I'm not that tall. <laughs> um, so my name's Juan, uh, I'm Mexican, but you know, it's like, um, I told one of my professors, uh, just speak a, loud, a little oh. louder to the mic so I can hear you better. Yeah, uh, and then so I, I'm Mexican, but I told, um, I told one of my professors, the one that brought us out here, is that uh, like Latinx history also has black history ingrained in it. So it's one of those things that we can't forget about it. One of the things that kind of like kept on coming up in my mind was growing up in Mexico, everybody would always say, la raza, la raza, la raza. But a couple years ago, I found out that that term was just kind of used to erase the other cultures around, you know, because like you had, they had like the caste system, you know, it's like mestizos and everything. And then, so that, that was just like one of the things that like came up in my mind. And I just want to say thank you for this great speech that you gave to us. Thank you. And just so you know, you know, you, you're talking about the, the Chicano, Chicanx movement, right? Which was radical. And the creation of La Raza is to find a political like point that folks were coming together, right? But just like anything could be co-opted, like Afro Latinidad. I don't. I'm like this whole thing is crazy because Afro Afro Latinidad erases African people. And then what we hear in the academy is like we're talking about indigenous people. Absolutely, but you don't then trade one for the other. But you know, in the academic space, this milk toast kind of watery politic, right? So for me, I'm just like, I'm part of the black radical struggle. I don't care if it's black people in New Zealand, Australia, in the Bronx, Albany, New York, you know? Because it's my, it, I'm, I'm choosing to be part of the larger tradition. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hello, I hope, I, I hope I'm loud enough. Um, I wanted to ask a question because I'm actually an assistant director for a black cultural center. And um, one of the problems that we have is that we adver advertise everywhere that, that we serve the diaspora. But what happens at my particular university is that our Afro-Latinx um, students don't come to the multicultural place because there's Mahente and they don't feel like they belong there but they also don't feel like they belong in our black cultural space. So what could we be doing different in our space that would make them feel more welcomed? Yeah, I mean, I'll start with, it, 
it's not the greatest series, but the Black and Latin America series that Dr. Gates did. It's over 15 years ago. You know, and it really also, you get to understand Mexico, but you have a better understanding of the Dominicans. And what I had missed in saying in the Dominican Republic, there was a dictator through Hijo, and he was a white supremacist. He would put like white powder on his face. He would encourage lighter Dominicans to marry other lighter Dominicans. And then he's also responsible for the Haitian slaughter and the slaughter of Afro-Dominican, black Dominicans who've been struggling. So I'm like, it's like I was saying earlier, it's so easy for people to write off um, certain groups, you know, or to write off Dominicans or Puerto Ricans or Mexicanos to say, you know, well, you know, you're Mexican, you're not black, or like, why are you here? So what I would do is, I always start with something in the media, you know? I would encourage people to see the work of Rebel Diaz, Chilean brothers, Chicago, their history is incredible. Study Chicago, study Puerto Rican and African American communities in Chicago, you know? But what is good is, especially in the digital space, is there are a lot of blogs or things that I follow, like Afro-Latinas, and, and you know, there's debate happening right now where some younger people are telling people like me, like, y'all mad light and you're keeping out. <laughs> I, I mean, somebody literally was like, yo, you're mad light, like, why do you call yourself black and you can't represent Afro and black Latino people? And I'm like, you're 22, like, read five books, holler at me later. And I usually don't say that to younger people, I'm not that person. But I'm like, don't start attacking us because you're so caught up in colorism, what's the difference then? If you're saying you're biracial, I know mad, but my whole, all my cousins are basically um, German or Irish. My mom has 16 brothers and sisters. I have like 107 cousins. 90 of them are straight, quote, Puerto Rican, Irish, German, Italian, right? So you're gonna see, as many we see, I got the blackest of the black, and then I got cousins that got red hair and blue eyes, you know what I'm saying? But that is dangerous, because they're trying to centralize something, and it's like, then what's the arbiter? Or if you're darker than a paper bag, then you're black? You see what I'm saying? That's, that, that, you know, as my husband Justice would be like, they be crafty and really trying to divide us. I'm like, yeah, or as the nation of gods and earth say, technology around that. Um, and I also would study the Moorish, people. The Moors ruled Spain for 500 years, you know? Um, and, you know, people want to think, or it's too much work. So black, um, of course, black and Latin, uh, Latin America is a six-part series. I would also show, if you can, the full eyes on the prize. Not the first six, but the other six that didn't go to air because it was too radical. Um, people like a, a Rebel Diaz, you know, I, I look at some of the dope MC Anna Tijau, from, from Chile, who's been like part of the artistic front, you know, in Puerto Rico. I would also, look, I mean, in, in Chile. And you know what, like, Bad Bunny's interesting, right? Because, no, in a good way, like, I, you know, you know, I mean, if he dates Kendall Jenner, then I'm like, wow, really? Bad Bunny, you can find somebody. <laughs> But look, Bad Bunny is important in the history, the new resistance in Puerto Rico because when the governor, and we were, and I covered this too, when they were, were trying to get rid of the governor, when Residente and, and Bad Bunny called for young people, a million and a half Puerto Ricans were in the streets those days, and Jose Joel did leave. He had no choice. So Bad Bunny has a better analysis around race, but he's also someone that respects hip hop culture, not just the music industry. And when he performs too, he does a lot of dope subliminal stuff, right? When he performed at the Grammys, he had the Dominican and Puerto Rican flag together. When he is like, I'm gonna dress how I am, he's opening what, help, helping bring along what's also happening in Puerto Rico, younger, Puerto Ricans who are growing up in a time where we're still a colony, um, you know, the, the, the government is, is putting pressure, um, inflation is crazy, but when you look at culture, 
You know, only someone like Bad Bunny could have opened up a space for younger um, folks in Puerto Rico to also become unapologetically LGBTQIA. Puerto Rico also has a very serious problem about femicide, and there have been four trans uh, and queer women that were beaten to death. And most of those that did the beating are cops. And that's a tricky with Puerto Rico, right? Puerto Rican cops. So people are like, oh, they're black. I'm like, we got black cops. They'd be killing us too. Like, you know, that's not an arbitrator. So those kind of things I think are important for people to understand culturally. And what Bad Bunny did with his song is then the next eight minutes of the video is breaking down what is the recolonization of Puerto Rico, but the amount of white people that are going there and gentrifying and taking away our homes because in Puerto Rico and the Caribbean, you get your house passed down. Nobody ever has a title or a deed. So now you have all these young white cryptocurrency, and you know the tourism is is is, is it's not a bad thing. But what's happening in Puerto Rico is basically, and I said this during our work on PR on the map. They want a Puerto Rico without Puerto Ricans. They want their tax haven, you know? And if they cannot do it around other Puerto Ricans, I mean, these people are crazy. They were trying to close down a public beach. Every beach in Puerto Rico's, you know, public. But also then they were killing the turtles. You're like, come on, man. Don't come to our, our community. But we've been, we're a colony, right? So the United States government tramps on us. Puerto Rico, uh, rich men like Jose Joe, the, you know, are basically trying to make Puerto Rico a tax haven. So those are the things that are important, and I really do, as a Boricua, understand and love that Bad Bunny did not wait to be told. That's his people. He's going to use his music to push the politics of younger people. So, anybody else? Yeah. Um, good evening. Thank you so much, Rosa Clemente. I'm proud to say to um, Sakpasenabule, to my Haitian sisters and brothers, uh, January 1st, 1804, the first country to be free, democracy comes from the island of Haiti. And so I wanted to talk more about, because in the census, actually, where Haiti is located, we are also considered Latino. That's in terms of, but we are not accepted as Latino. I've never seen myself as Latino, even though so many people that are Haitian speak Spanish, Haitian Creole, and French. How do we bring together um, Haitian people, Dominican, like the whole diaspora of the Caribbean? What, I mean, what more can we do? It feels so desperate. <laughs> yeah, you know what, what and it, for those who are leaving, if you want a business card, you could come up here. Stop at the Speak Out booth. That's the Speakers Bureau I'm with. They, they brought so many of us. But look, Haiti is always going to bear the brunt of United States and French governmental military. You, you know. Now, I, I, I remember this was a conversation because I had a couple of my Haitian friends. And I'm like, y'all don't want to be Latino. See, these terms are not powerful at all. You know, so uh, Latino, Latina, Latina, this is what I say, X, E, all of that. It's not a race, it's not an ethnicity, and it doesn't refer to land. And as Malcolm said, the basis for all revolution is land. And that's why, until maybe a new generation of Haitians come in, but look, the thing is, every time Haiti's on a path of collective government, the United States and NATO go in there to destabilize it. So. You know, it, it's also like what we're seeing, what we're seeing with undocumented people. Now, 30 years ago, those quote Latinos were really white. No. That's why they're doing what they're doing on the border. Because it's black people from Mexico, Venezuela, Haiti, Cuba, like, you know, I'm like, y'all wouldn't look trying to round up Argentinians or light-skinned Dominicans. Oh, oh, well, yeah, I mean, look, that's the other thing. Look, the, the, what's going on with, 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 with um, Ukraine, right? It, it's just other white men do, making, trying to get global power. I agree with you, you know, I'm like $7 billion to Ukraine, but we have to start paying our student loans next week because the Democrats are bullshit and all they do 
Yo, let me tell you right now how bad, yo, I don't know where, I'm not a Democrat. And I'm not a vote shit. I don't, if people are like, I don't vote, I'm like, absolutely don't do you. Don't vote, fine. Because the whole system is messed up, right? And we see what can happen because the two, I would say two things that we have to be mindful of. These Republicans are trying to figure out how they can take out people elected into office. It started with what happened in Tennessee. The people voted for them and you decide that they can't represent the people who voted for them, so they're gonna remove two young black men and the w one white woman who they gave her the thing back. You know what I'm saying? So we're in a really crazy time, y'all. So the what, what is coming down, United States imperialism is trying to hold on. And with Russia and China, right now the geopolitical world United States, nobody wants, right? So now, with this debt deal, do you know that with this, another pipeline got approved? The Democrats ran on stopping pipelines. The deal that made gives 6.6 .6 billion to a new pipeline project. That's what got traded, as well as the bull crap that they're like, people who have food stamps should work. Are there jobs that allow them to pay their rent? I don't think so. Something good that's been happening though is unions. Maybe unions are getting a little stronger. But we have to just be critically aware of what's going on in the world. What the United States is happening with demographic change is this. We could very well look like South Africa, right? The majority of people in this country will be people of color and it will be a small 1% of 1% are of mostly white men, and then the sellouts like Clarence Thomas, Condoleezza Rice, and all the mostly African-American Latino people in power that just sell us out, they don't care, they have no respect for us. Right now, they're trying to figure out how they can hold on to power, right? That's what's happening. So all of this stuff happens within the context of a geopolitical world. So I, I do think that we also, as you have brought up the internationalism, that we as a people have to be international as well. Young people, get out of this country, get a passport, go somewhere, see something different, you know? But the, the situation when undocumented people, and I do work with the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, because I was talking to the ED, Nana, who actually was our lawyer when we had to go to trial for the arrest in uh, at LA. You know, all those places are black and brown. My dad's like, um, why are people speaking in Spanish? I'm like, dad, because they're black from Venezuela, dude. They've been, you know, like, it, because that's all, they're not even showing them as human beings. So even this whole thing with our immigration, right? We, we dropped the ball on that. And honestly, the, the, the dreamer is not what they wanted. Um, what happened during these big protests in 2016 is then the dream, dreamers became a, a word and people support the people who are dreamers, but what it also did was pit immigrants with immigrants undocumented people, right? Because the DREAM Act is supposed to make sure that those um, in education or, who are dreamers don't um, get deported, but they've deported people and they're still deporting families. So I, I, I would caution people like, when you're seeing what's going on on the border, look at who it's happening to, you know? I think we have time for one more question. Oh, it's 5.09. So if there's another question, I'll take it. Yeah, no, for sure. We could finish, yeah. Um, just first of all, I'd just like to thank you. Um, I'm from New York, from East Harlem. My family's Dominican and Puerto Rican. And luckily for me, like I had, my grandmother was very politically active in um, New, York, New York City. She was actually removed from the Dominican Republic after Juan Bosch was kicked out. Um, but I, I also wanted to shout out Haiti because I think we don't, Dominicans don't give enough uh, Haitians like credit for, for freedom. I mean, if it wasn't for the Haitians, we would have been like definitely enslaved for as long as Cuba or other other speaking Spanish speaking countries. But that's, but I really wanted to ask you real quick, um, as a person who is of Dominican and Puerto Rican descent, I often hear from my black American friends who grew up in New York and you know they hear Puerto Ricans and Dominicans using the N word and saying this and saying that and 
talking about black women and their hair and like it's I, I, which is totally inappropriate. How do we how do we go about um, educating, but then also not like trying to get distracted, I guess, because I, I know you mentioned, you know, we talk about Dominicans being super anti-black, which a lot of them are, um, and I know that, like, that term was talked about as well, but, like, how do you, how do you, you know, hold them accountable while also not getting lost in everything else? Because I think, you know, in terms of the black American experience, I mean, you grew up in New York, so you know that, like, yeah. we, we, we live together. Like, in East Harlem, it's, it's either black American or Puerto Rican with a little bit of Mexican, but like, that's the majority. So how do you go about doing both? Yeah, so every, first this is, has to be also about geographically where we're located. So in New York City, right, especially older Boricuas, mostly some of the men, right, and Dominican, that generation did not get along, right? That, that's true. We call that inter-ethnic conflict. That happens everywhere, you know? Like in, in Chicago, Puerto Ricans, African Americans, and now the, the majority of uh, Latinos in Chicago may now be Mexicanos, Central Americans. In, in New York, we've seen an influx in the last 15 years of Central Americans. You know, you know, the Bronx actually to this day is still the most diverse part of the country, but it's also the poorest part. You know what I'm saying? So that's when you intervene, you know, especially if there's anti not just blackness, but they're anti-Dominican, anti-Puerto Rican. I think the system of divide and conquer, well, the, the first tenant in the system of white supremacy is divide and conquer. And that still applies. You know, but I'm all about like intervening, sharing your experience, but also I realize that identity is nothing that we can force on people. It's a very personal journey. Right? But doing part of this work is, you know, like people say in the movement, you know, if you can't talk to your family, then can you organize? I get why people say that, but look, I'm also a person who I don't deal with the anti black people in my family. I don't talk to them, I don't go to your parties, don't come to the family reunion. I don't, because I have a black daughter, I have a black husband, if we want to use that term in that way, right? It doesn't matter that I have specifically a black Puerto Rican daughter, but I had to be like, yo, y'all been doing this, and you know, not only anti-black, anti-Mexican. And I'm like, no. So no, I don't care that you're blood. Like, you know, we have to put boundaries also around our own mental health. And sometimes it could feel like you're banging your head. And sometimes it's just like, you know what? You're not gonna get it. Like, peace, keep it moving, you know? But part of the work is, People pushing back, people saying why, and part of our work as organizers is to also understand the streets to me, these are grassroots intellectual people. The streets know, and when you get into deep discussion, right, and then you, you kind of see people start to be like, we are alike, the cops, New York City, right? So that's New York, but how that works in Iowa is different. How that works on the island of Puerto Rico is different. That's why specifically my work is affirmations of black Latinx narratives, but also particularly Puerto Ricans who were born in the United States that grew up as co-creators of hip hop culture. Because a lot of the Afro-Latinx black work happening in academia is studying countries. Not that I was born here. You know, Big Pun was born here, Fat Joe was born here, Rosie Perez, you know, the, these kind of maybe Afro-Latinos, although Rosie Perez doesn't say she's Afro-Latino, she's like, that divides our people. But then like when Fat Joe was like, no, no, this is our people, right? Because Fat Joe and Big Pun and the people of my generation, it's not just we know, we're living together. The, the whole system is coming at us. The police are abusive. You know, Big Pun didn't know Spanish. But to this day, Boricua Morena, you put that and people hear it, that was a big intervention that he did. And he wasn't doing it as a politic. He's like, yo, that's where I live, Boricua Morena, right? Um, yeah, so I think that's what you, what you do, you know? And then sometimes you're just like, that's a lost cause. Let me work with somebody else. So um, I have cards. If anybody's interested in booking me for a talk, speak, uh, go to the Speak Out booth. Um, I'm gonna be at the party tonight celebrating 50 years of hip hop. Uh, Davey is DJing and the incredible uh, DJ Cutting Candy. 
Series X is gonna be there, Omeka, if you haven't met him and his work, you know. So I just wanna first say thank you to everybody who stayed a little longer. Uh, thank you to Speak Out. I'm so happy to be part of their crew. And I'm gonna have fun because, um, and I wanna thank so many people who have been following my health journey and have just given me and my family support. So whatever, is your way of connecting with something bigger. I'm having surgery again at the end of June, throw out the prayers, the burn the sage, <laughs> all of that. And um, I feel confident, but you know, no matter what, I'm gonna do what I do, keep it moving. So thank you all.